He says, you know, back in 1985, uh, they caught Slash out here totally naked running through the golf course. He was staying right there in that room and he was on acid and he didn't know where he was and all that. And <laughs> that Slash was not going to survive to play what he's playing now. He crashed his, he crashed a, a Pathfinder on Sunset, rolled it over about 10 times. Like that. And you know, typical Slash back in the day, you know, if you recognize him, like the, he'd drive home drunk. One night he got pulled over by the cops. Cops got him out of the car. He's fucking barely standing up. Hey, Slash, can we take our picture with you? <laughs> <laughs> fucking cops like this with Slash. Now just get, get home now. You put that guy back in the fucking car? Are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, fringe benefits of the hat, you know what I mean? Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to Guns N' Roses. And when people think of Slash and his time in Guns N' Roses, they think of all these crazy stories. I'm assuming you guys probably haven't heard that story before. And the story from Alice Cooper you probably read about in his book. And today I want to talk about Slash's health scare from 2001. I talked about the time he overdosed in 1992 while in Oakland on tour with Metallica. But this is a story I haven't talked about yet. And this is something that Slash first alluded to almost the same year it happened. Now, a lot of fans didn't really learn about it until his 2007 autobiography, but he gave an interview to Howard Stern just before he performed with Michael Jackson in September of 2001, where he basically said he stopped drinking because it came, as he put it, to, uh, to bite him back in the ass. Here's what he had to say about why he stopped drinking. Uh, anyway, uh, Slash, um, are you still smoking cigarettes? When are you going to stop that? You're, you're a it's health my, freak. It's my last real good vice. No, I, come on. Are you drinking still? Not really. No. Uh, did you go to rehab? Uh-uh. No. Why are you not drinking? You're legendary for drinking. Um, you know, there just came a point there where it just sort of came up and bit me in the ass. You, you were know? getting sloppy. Uh, yeah, exactly. And so I said, all right, you know. And uh, I had a little, I spent a week in the hospital. <laughs> oh, what hospital? So, somewhere in Pittsburgh. And what was what was wrong? <laughs> it's right. just excess. Just leave it at that. Like, really? a, like a Mariah so I, Carey visit? Like uh, no, no, no. This was this was a physical, this was the real deal. What it happened? was in the middle of a tour, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I wasn't feeling good, but knowing me, I just kept going and kept going and kept going. And my tour manager at the time was like, you should go get yourself checked out. So I went to, I, yeah, I thought, well, I'll go to the doctor, then I'll do sound check, or I'll do so sound check, then go to the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and it was not going to be any big thing. So, so I went before sound check, and you know, once I got in there, it was all she wrote. It was like, really, you're not going anywhere, man. <laughs> wow. And so, you know, so I, I was on my back actually for a week in Pittsburgh and for another week in L.A. But so I got all completely cleaned out. And Guns like, and Roses was a real deal. I mean, you guys didn't worry oh, about yeah. your <laughs> health. I mean, you guys drank. Yeah, and there's there's, there, there's a, a, a mentality that you just don't have when you have that kind of a history. Yeah. You just don't think about what normal, you know, your, your morality <laughs> rate is. So in Slash's book, he talked about exactly what happened and what he was doing at this time. So he alluded to a tour. And he was touring with Snake Pit at this point in time. They had just finished supporting ACDC on the Stiff Upper Lip Tour. And he said that after the ACDC tour, we did a headlining tour of theaters. And it was actually costing me money personally. But I didn't care. And after two months, Koch ditched us. So Koch Records was the record label they released um, Ain't Life Grand under. And it was really not a very great label for Slash because, you know, they were a small-time label. They didn't really support the record like he'd hoped. And he said they pulled out tour support and didn't promote the thing at all. We'd show up to signings and the record wouldn't even be in the stores. I'd have to make a call to get a box of them sent out that day. It was way too spinal tap. So he went on to say, as the tour wore on, I remember progressively not feeling well. In Pittsburgh, I remember thinking that I should go to the hospital before sound check. And my next memory is waking up two weeks later in a hospital bed with Perla sitting there looking very worried. I had suffered cardiac myopathy. Years of overdrinking had swollen my heart to the point of rupture, to the point where it barely was strong enough to circulate any blood properly. And I couldn't even get it through my head that I was out of commission, but I was. The doctors gave me six days to six weeks to live, but not much more. Once I was well enough to finally fly back to L.A., I was on bed rest and forbidden from drinking or any kind of strenuous physical activity. The doctors installed a defibrillator to keep my heart from stopping and to keep my heart rate steady. 
After a time, I began therapy, basically starting very minimal exercise and working my way up. Miraculously, my heart started to heal, and the doctors could not believe that my condition was improving. Eventually, I was able to play again, and I was determined to finish up the club tour. I had been out of circulation for about four months, and I was not—I was actually totally sober. And when I saw the band again, this time through clear eyes, I realized how dysfunctional it was. Between the junkie singer who was on the verge of withdrawal at any moment and the bass player, they seemed like they wanted nothing but to live the whole lifestyle that I had a reputation for but in my new clear-minded state it appeared to me that the whole thing was very unprofessional and all over the place a couple of the guys seemed less committed than the guys in my high school bands who had been and they were basically creating the whole thing like a free ride or treating the thing like a free ride and no one was carrying their weight i spent the rest of those dates when i wasn't on stage in my bunk and when we got back to la after the last gig i stayed up there till everybody was gone and that was the last time i spoke to any of them for quite some time i'm good friends with johnny and matt again now that enough time has passed. Now Slash's ex-wife Perla tells a different story of how Slash ended up in the hospital in Pittsburgh. In fact, Slash, according to her, didn't even want to go to the hospital. And it was Slash's tour manager who punched him in the face and then got him to the doctors in Pittsburgh to check him out. He wouldn't go to the hospital. Uh, It wasn't, I don't know if you know the story or not, but it was the tour manager that punched him, knocked him out, and dropped him off at the hospital in Pittsburgh after he spoke to me. And I showed up, and we were there, and the doctor looked at me, and we weren't married yet at the time, and he said, I'm sorry, but he's got either six days, six weeks, um, or six months, and uh, there's not much we can do. So we did everything that they possibly could. This was in Pittsburgh. We were there for a few weeks, and then we flew back to L.A., went to another hospital. They wanted to give him a heart transplant. Um, I'm not one to... Uh, follow direction or 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 listen to even doctors that that much tell you the truth and we left that hospital went to another hospital where they gave him the defibrillator and uh, he was playing with Michael Jackson so like Perla alluded to he was on stage with Michael Jackson and I think it was his first time on stage since his heart scare but one thing that Slash failed to do was tell doctors how high his heart rate gets whenever he's on stage performing and his pacemaker went off, but he thought he stepped maybe on a pyrotechnic or maybe that he was hit by something else. Here's what his wife had to say about him playing with Michael Jackson and the feeling he was experiencing. And the pyrotechnics went off, and he thought he was getting blasted or shocked from all the pyrotechnics. He didn't realize that it was a defibrillator going off because the doctors didn't set it properly. They didn't realize how fast his heart rate would go. So the thing's firing on him. He's like, whoa, I thought, you know, those pyrotechnics, were they that were they that hard? Because, you know, I felt like they were blasting me. When we got back to L.A., we went to have it read. The doctor says that it was going off. According to an interview that Slash did with David Letterman when he was promoting his autobiography in 2007, he said he was sober for a couple of years and then he started drinking with the wine again. And if you read his book, he also started falling back into pills. And quite recently this year, back in February of this year, Slash revealed what almost killed him in Velvet Revolver. So he was asked how close to drinking and drugging himself to death he came in a new Kerrang! interview, and he mentioned the Velvet Revolver days in 2000s being pretty bad. He said, I had enough of those experiences where most people would go, okay, I'm done with this, but it didn't put any fear into me whatsoever. I kept doing whatever I was doing, so all things considered, I managed to function and keep going. It didn't really become an issue until 2005, and there was a period in 2001 when I was really sick from alcohol poisoning, and that slowed me down for a minute, and then it started back up. Up again. He said 2004 and 2005 were pretty bad and finally in 2006 I was like you know what this isn't fun anymore. You can't recreate that initial effing buzz you had back in the 1980s and it's never going to be that good again. And I slowly and surely got out but it was really hard to get out from underneath all that dependency. And finally here's some clips of some of his friends and bandmates talking about Slash's drinking and his heart problems and his struggles and kind of compared it to their own struggles as well. Slash and I both, you know, uh, struggled with um, outside things, drugs and alcohol, and uh, both lived through it, which is kind of incredible in itself. And, you know, we've had a lot of uh, friends of ours fall uh, by the wayside on the way here. I think one of the best things that's happened to him is his heart problem. And he, he was a pacemaker. And that has obviously changed his 
um, playing field. I, I believed if he would have tried to stick around in Guns N' Roses when Axel was in charge of it back in 1996, I, th I truly think he'd be dead. Yeah. Well, he's just, you know, the defibrillator inserted in me. <laughs> you know, never even, he never even bought me dinner. And uh, he's got a pacemaker, you know. So he came over to sympathize and point out what he shouldn't do. Like, I shouldn't fibrillate, apparently. Or it goes, bam! <laughs> So that does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching, let me know your thoughts in the comments section below, be sure to like button and subscribe and go check us out at gnrcentral.com for the latest Guns N' Roses news.